this one, it's called the Dust Lickers, and what he's saying is that nowadays we consume so much, and not just food, but we consume television, radio, and uh, after this, social media, but you can throw that in there too. We're just consuming, consuming all day long, expecting to feel full, but it's just like eating dust. You still walk away hungry for more. Uh, in this image, we've got, you know, a, another kind of universal of being human, which is that we have a mother who's desperately trying to protect her baby. Uh, she, her, her one eye is obscured over here, but this one looks incredibly worried and concerned, like you're going to be taking that baby away. And it kind of spotlights that eye and draws us in. He also feels persecuted by the Norwegian government over taxes and they've threatened to throw him in jail and things like that. So he, uh, you know, you might say, here's the woman again and she's fleeing, she's crossing the border. That might be a representation of himself, actually. Holding that baby, what's that baby? Kitchen. That's a baby, not her belly. Yeah, the woman's holding a baby, and it, she kind of looks like Odin too. Yeah, she does. Okay, so this is the very last artist I'm going to look at today. I'm sorry we've gone over time a little bit, but um, his name's Vincent Desiderio, and in this image, he's given us hundreds of art history books that are all open. And it, in the same sense as Odd Nerdrum was rep, uh, referencing the dust liquors and our consumption of everything, here he is referencing his consumption of art history. So these are all his books. Um, I mean, I can see some of them. Here's, here's Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring here. I know it's kind of hard to tell because it's so small here on this screen. But, so, it's kind of his critique of what he calls cultural bulimia. Our compulsive consumption of images that only leaves us hungry for more. And it's also a comment on the predicament of painting in the 21st century. So, faced with such a plethora of styles, how is it possible to create something new? Something distinctly relative to our own time? This is a painting of himself with his son who is disabled and on a respirator. It's an uncomfortable family scene. He's really led us into something that's deeply personal. But it's not uncomfortable in, in the way that Fischl is. Remember it was, those kind of domestic scenes where you know the man is consuming the boy. It's, it's not that kind of scene. So the title references the Rati, which are like reserved intellectuals who, who mostly write breakthrough ideas. And here we have what seem to be insane asylum patients that have just escaped and maybe we've come <laughs> upon them with our car. So, I mean, the Rati could reference you know, being free, being liberated, or maybe they know something, or their their madness actually gives them more clarity than than what we have. This is like a Ken Russell film. I know it looks a little bit small here on this screen, but uh, this is a painting called Sleep, where we've got about 25 bodies all in a row, sleeping in the same bed. And what, what's really interesting about this is that we don't have a cognitive frame for this, 
for this art. So, in the language of the brain, words and thoughts are defined relative to narrative frames and conceptual metaphors. We are not born with these complex fractal narratives, the kinds we find in everyone's life story, as well as in fairy tales, novels, and drama. Rather, they're patterned into our nervous system as a result of experience. So we have in our minds reference frames for what sleeping people look like in a bed. And it's never 25 people. We don't have a reference frame for this. So it really throws us off. It's same with the, all the books on the floor. Like, what is going on? This is, I, I, I can't really, I'm searching my database and I, I, I can't find the answer. It reminds me of one of those Roman catacombs where you see skulls, right? One right next to each other, except these are still living bodies. Yeah. Well, from here, without my glasses, it looks like a mass grave. You know, oh, interesting. Like, yeah. Like, like in Star Wars creation. Well, and, and to go back on um, the one we saw before where you thought they were inhabitants of an asylum who had escaped, I saw, was perceiving it. I think it has a lot of relationship with death. And I was seeing that as newly liberated of the earthly bound bonds. Newly liberated of the earthly bonds? Yes. Interesting. So Kanye West created a sculpture that ripped off that previous painting for one of his music videos. Um, that's Kanye in the middle. And his wife, Kim Kardashian, with the butt beside him. And then, I mean, there's a, you would probably know most of these celebrities that's Donald Trump over there, too. Oh my god. But this came from, this came from, yeah, okay, we'll go, yeah. This came from, uh, you know, he ripped it right off of Vincent Desiree. It's pretty interesting. That looks like El Bosco. Okay, so. These are the last kind of paintings I'm going to come to with Vincent Desiderio. And this one references a story about Theseus and Theseus, Theseus's boat that rotted on voyage. And all parts had to be replaced by the time he arrived. So is it still the same boat by the time you get there, if all the parts have been replaced? So we see him, this is the same Theseus image, but it's becoming more and more abstract. And it's even referencing Jackson Pollock's work. And so what he's saying is we should not react negatively to abstract work, like what Roger Scruton, that conservative philosopher, is saying. Because it's our history. This is, this is what we have to work with. So let's build upon it. Let's use it. So, oh, that's you. I just want to conclude and say that representational art is not the only kind of art being made today. I know I just gave you a ton of it right at this moment, so it may seem like that's the only thing going on, but it, it's not. It's there's a there's a really large sea of different kinds of conceptual art, installation art, all kinds of things, all over the board. But what we can use representational art for is to give us a narrative once again, which people seem really starved for in their art. They don't necessarily want to read a text panel in order to get that narrative. They want to be able to understand it with their eyes. And this kind of art is reconnecting with people again. And it's not being driven by curators and in art institutions. It's being driven by the artists and the people, the viewers. Um, there has been a, a modern art bias against representational art as being old-fashioned and stuffy. But as we've seen with these artists, it's anything but conservative. I mean, look at Audner Drum's painting of himself with an erection. You, you can hardly call that conservative. Uh, so 
representational art is building a slow momentum. So it seems that the pendulum swing has gone way over to abstract art, and we're just we're just starting another swing back. So we don't really know where it will go. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll just be doing nothing but hyper-realism one day. But we're, we're starting to just get this slow movement back. Um, it seems to be more than just a fad as well. It's not just something that's going to change with the seasons. Uh, because the purpose of this kind of work is to probe deeper into ourselves as human beings and to understand what we are all about, and that will never go out of fashion. <laughs> That's it. Any questions? Or? Yeah, Jim. It seems like a lot of the examples of marriage that you gave are the same. What the hell is going on category as the other part, the modern part? And it would require a text and do you feel that some of this narrative art that I've shown you from today is is not understandable as well? Oh, well, I mean, sometimes sometimes I don't exactly know what is happening, but my mind is constructing a narrative for that image, and I find that kind of satisfying. So it's more it's thing that you can get something out of. I'm free to make up whatever that narrative is. I'm just thinking about the thing that everybody didn't like or the thing that might be a bra or a sad or whatever. I mean, you can look at that and also make up something. Yeah. I, mean, I suppose you could, yeah. Yeah, we did. Some people said it's a bra, some said it's a saddle, some said it could reference this or that. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for the artist. For Elliot? Elliot, yes. When you did Les Mademoiselles de Avignon, uh, did you purposefully eliminate all signs of cubism? I did, uh, more or less. I, I actually uh, took the I took a Adobe Photoshop and I took the original painting and uh, took my photographs of, of my models and superimposed them over the, the Picasso and then morphed them so that it as closely as possible within the realm of possibility would superimpose the Picasso so that I had the same composition, the same distortions uh, to some extent. Uh, but I, I got rid of the angles and I made it more naturalistic. And I, I, I had to make a call on, uh, I, don't, I don't go in for photorealism uh, usually, so I had, to, I had to make a compromise between the two. Uh, distortions of things, and I've always, I've always liked the rose period, so I kind of settled on that as, a, as an intermediate style. Did you have a sense of the temporal um, phenomena going on in Picasso's or Mademoiselle's? I don't know. I, we were discussing this in the break, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's a big discussion, uh, but I, I think a lot of that was more arbitrary than what they, at the time, made it out to be. And so I think that it was a, uh, well, there was a lot of uh, industrial age uh, uh, depersonalization happening with figures and idealization of the sort. And I think that was part of what was happening. Okay, maybe I'll Very just... Very interesting. Yeah. It's kind of getting kind of late already. We've gone over time. So maybe I'll just take one more question. But I also want to say that we're going to do a discussion on this uh, at a later date during the People's Dialogue, right? Which is the... March 15th. Yeah, March 15th, 5.30 at Rendezvous, just off Belmont. And we're going to talk more about representational art and get more into a discussion there. But if... Maybe just one more question, and we'll kind of try to wrap it up. Uh, so she's wondering, in my research, why I think that representational art is making a back, uh, comeback, and I might just say the sheer amount of it. 
I see so much of it. And I, I look at a lot of art, so. Pardon? What's the motivation to create representation art? Well, I, what I think is that is that people have, despite the lofty goals of modern art to create an art that's uh, neutral, that's accessible to everybody, they've actually what has happened is an elitist art has come out of that. People don't really understand modern art when they go look at it in a gallery. And so, because of that, there's there's been a kind of a need for an art that speaks to everyone, not just art world insiders. So I think that would be the motivation behind representational art, in that we all see things in the world and, and we can understand them. Don't you think, though, that's also a tool of the artist needing to survive, that quite often artists will adapt what their subject matter is, what their technique is, because no one artist I know only works in one particular style, but we adapt it because that's what galleries are looking for. So when the galleries are saying, well, you know, we really want landscapes, you start going out and doing more plein air. Right, so is it a viewer-driven art or is it an artist-driven art? I think some of it is survival. All right, shall we, shall we call it a minute?